Good afternoon and uh, welcome back to the Visa Conference. Um, in this session, we are going to be talking about the cold chain and the critical role it plays in the modern world. Um, a very warm welcome to Stephen Gill, my good friend. Um, he is an independent refrigeration consultant and he is CEO of World Refrigeration Day, and we're going to come to that in a minute. Um, the term industry legend is, is one that's too often banded around, to be honest. But uh, in the refrigeration and air conditioning world, Steve certainly fits that bill. He is a multiple award winning consultant, and um, well, at least that's the day job. As I say, he's also the founder and uh, CEO of World Refrigeration Day. He's also been a major influence in getting initiatives like Women in RACHP off the ground, driving the diversity agenda into the wider public arena, and a huge supporter of the STEM Amazing scheme, which is, all start is also starting to rack up awards now because of the proactive way that they are engaging with school children to let them see what our sector is about and how exciting a career in engineering can be. There we go. So, what is World Refrigeration Day? It is undoubtedly the coolest day of the year. It's June the 26th, which is the anniversary of the birth of Lord Kelvin, William Thompson, first Baron Kelvin. The man credited with specifying the value of absolute zero, which is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, for those who don't know, and after whom we have the Kelvin scale of absolute temperature. After many years of Steve trying to promote the idea of a World Refrigeration Day to promote the sector and its enormous contribution to the modern world, we finally went live on June the 26th, 2018 with this tweet. You'll note that I called it World RECHP Day at the time, um, whereas World Ref Day became the more accepted hashtag in subsequent years. Hence my tweet becoming a little obsolete. And Steve quickly followed up this with engagement with UNIP and um, UN, uh, the UN Ozone Action Team so that we can make this a truly global event annually. The following June 2019 saw the first global celebration with um, thousands of events happening around the world, celebrating the sector and how it affects people in so many different ways around the planet. So how does the cold chain affect you, you might well ask. Food production temperatures need temperature and or humidity control. The phrase from field to fork is what we use in the storage of raw foods. The mass production prep areas, the uh, transportation of food ready for sale, the storage of food ready for sale in the retail outlets, chilled storage in commercial kitchens, chilled storage in the home, the um, sorry, the process cooling applications, the all important drinks display cabinets. Pharmaceutical um, factories where they're actually developing medicines, they require very strictly controlled production areas. And of course, the pharmacies themselves and the uh, display outlets, um, the controlled temperature and humidity storage. This was something that was brought really sharply into focus this time last year when the COVID vaccines were first coming to market. And some were needing to be transported and stored at minus 70 degrees C before being delivered to the delivery centres where they need to be kept between two and eight degrees C for a further five days. So the importance of the cold chain in the, the COVID vaccination process was really, really important. Surgeons do an incredibly difficult job under enormous pressure and they need the indoor climate to be strictly controlled so they can work comfortably. You can't have a surgeon with sweat dripping off them with open wounds on the patient, for example. You need to have the incoming air to be as sterile as possible and without too much humidity. The scanners, they're critical in diagnosing problems and illnesses, but they generate an enormous amount of heat. The scanners themselves, plus the sophisticated IT systems needed to operate them. And indeed, we can't keep the necessary blood supplies or get the essential medicines to Article 5 countries where they're most desperately needed without temperature and humidity control. Uh, heat pumps, um, absolutely essential if we're going to achieve our net zero targets and improve air quality in our inner cities. They all need refrigeration cycles um, reversed to operate efficiently in heating mode. 
and we've all become used to now seeing these um, domestic sized uh, heat pumps. These ones here are the um, monoblock package units. Uh, smart technology and the internet relies on huge amounts of data being used, all of which travels through data centers globally, which again requires massive amounts of cooling to keep them running efficiently. And again, the, pan the pandemic really hi highlighted just how important this is when so many of us are having to work from home for so many months. The Zoom, Skype and Teams calls, the interconnectivity, the ability for some of us to just carry on working seamlessly from our homes. None of that would have been possible without the internet streaming all of that data across the ether into each other's devices. Without the essential workers in the RACHP sector, it just wouldn't have been possible. And of course, the smart technology. Um, throw away your smartphone and say goodbye to streaming TV without refrigeration, keeping those data centers operating. Uh, ice cubes, keeping your GNT nicely chilled and ice creams, keeping the kids nicely chilled and uh, hopefully the parents as well. Typhoon Eurofighter jets, they actually have cooling systems on board for the pilots and the onboard systems, which are crucial to make that plane fly safely. Even the International Space Station has, uh, has large amounts of ammonia cooling to stop the astronauts and their experiments from being frazzled in orbit. I was actually at an evening with Major Tim Peake recently and he was talking about seeing these flashing lights when he tried to sleep and he closed his eyes when he was trying to sleep um, while he was spending six months on the International Space Station. Apparently our astronauts are exposed to the equivalent of 10 x-rays a day or something on average, which is quite disconcerting really. So world refrigeration there will serve as a means of raising awareness and understanding of the significant role that the industry and its technology play in modern life and society. Refrigeration is often called the hidden industry, and, and this is an opportunity to open the eyes of others to the important work we do and to let them know why our industry is so important to them. Uh, a number of UK industry bodies here under the ACRA umbrella are all proud to support World Refrigeration Day. This year actually marked the 197th birthday of Lord Kelvin, uh, whose name, of course, is synonymous with so many aspects of the refrigeration sector. So I expect in three years' time we'll have uh, a very big celebration for it uh, to celebrate Lord Kelvin's 200th birthday. And as I mentioned at the top, Steve has, always been, uh, has also been the driving force behind the Institute of Refrigeration's Women and RACHP Network and also the fantastic STEM Racing Project. The Women and RACHP Network is 819 strong now as a LinkedIn group and it has a volunteers working group which is 12 strong. Some truly inspirational people involved like IOR trustee Lisa Jane Cook, who you can see on the screen there, and on the STEM Azing website, where she was telling her story among a range of role models, all explaining why they do what they do to raise awareness. So it really is essential that we open people's eyes to the critical role that the supply, the cold chain plays in the supply chain and the role it plays in modern life. And like many sectors, of course, we face skills shortages. So this work is really essential if we are to let tomorrow's engineers understand the role that we play to understand how rewarding and exciting a career in engineering can be so that they can then in turn take up STEM subjects during and after their school life and seek a career in the cold chain. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Steve to talk through the rest of the Thank you, Graham. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the, the, uh, the head expanding introduction. It's uh, I was expecting to see my head go off the, the screen there with that, that fancy. Thank you very much. And yes, and thank you for the reminder that the first person to be up World Refrigeration Day, although as you, said, you, you were there right at the, the birth, so to speak. So uh, double thank you. And yeah, I mean, here's, I'm going to misquote Andrew David here on this slide because he didn't quite say exactly this. He, he said, if, if there's one thing we've learned from World Refrigeration Day, it is that, and he said, cooling, people are everywhere. And that that is something you've you've talked about the technology, uh, and from outer space to well everywhere you were talking about it is it is everywhere it touches our lives in so many different ways, but behind that technology is is people we 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 are a community of people worldwide we often talk about our, our it being a global industry it is also a global community and I think that is one thing that World Refrigeration Day has has been successful at 
And I don't know if you managed to find your, yourself on that screen. We won't, we won't pause while you do, Graham, but you are on there somewhere, as are uh, many others. So, so what is World Refrigeration Day about? We're very good at holding conferences as an industry, and we're very good at telling each other, like we are now, just how good we are and what we do. We're less good at telling other people outside of our industry what we do. What is happening in, and why is that important? Because refrigeration, cooling, decarbonization is very much heat pumps, is very much in the news at the moment with COP26 going on and, and everything else that is surrounding. But the message is not coming from ourselves. It is, is coming from, uh, I'll say, agencies to politicians and then to the news press, and then it's coming back to the public. We need to, to change our language so we can speak direct to the public and tell our own version of what is happening in our own story. And that is really what World Refrigeration Day is about. And there's potentially, I'm told there's about 15 million of us working around the world. So that's that's some voice if we unite. So what do we do? What do we do on World Refrigeration Day? Do we hold conferences? Yes, we do. But what else do we do? What else do the world do? Here's a, a I'm going to go through, through a few examples uh, on the next few slides. Um, and if Graham's still got his mic on, the, the, each of the logos for World Refrigeration Day on the next few slides is in a different language. The, the, by volunteers around the world, it's been translated into over, over 120 written languages. It's astonishing. Uh, yeah, but so uh, I won't ask Graham yet. We'll give him a chance to, to brush up on his um, Italian, Graham. I'll uh, we'll give him a chance on that one. I was going to say Italian. I was going to say Italian. Uh, okay. I don't even know what he gets, so. Okay. It's, World Refrigeration Day is outreach. So, the, it's, it's to talk to the general public. The top left picture is, is at, um, an open day in Germany. It's a training school where the, uh, it's a bit small on the screen, but there are uh, students and children going in and having its refrigeration and the importance of it explained to them. Uh, top right is um, in Australia, uh, where Phil, Phil Wilkinson, it is, uh, looking at him, is in telling uh, stories to school children. And there they are looking very pleased with themselves. Um, bottom right is again Australia, uh, just by chance, and that is a supermarket. Woolworths open their doors to the, the general public. And bottom left, and these are just examples, is in the UK. It's Train, who, who don't have a manufacturing facility here, I believe, but they opened their offices and gave uh, just a tour and this, uh, presentation to school children. So there's lots we can do. And the first year, 2019, when we, we actually had the event, there, there were... 153 there were events physical events in 153 countries that is an astonishing number of countries if you've ever looked at the globe uh there haven't been that many <laughs> since the since then we've had something called the pandemic if you hadn't noticed so it changed slightly in the number of physical events but that was the first year and we're, we're getting back to those sort of numbers now uh other things going on yes online and uh, graham i'll ask you the language in a minute by the way um uh, that's me <laughs> and the top left that that's <laughs> Japanese. Um, it's me struggling to with technology at, to, to do the, a webinar at the World Refrigeration Day in 2019. There are leaflets, flyers. That one's on refrigerants for life, I think. Um, bottom right, lots of online stuff, videos um, that can be shared around, obviously shared around on social media. Um, another idea, bottom left, uh, Hawco in the UK had their... Uh, employees' children draw pictures of what uh, refrigeration means to them. Um, so, over 300 associations. We, we saw on one of the slides from Graham, you know, the number of UK associations involved. There's now over 300. I didn't even know there were that many national associations around the world supporting this event. It is it is truly global. Now, uh, next slide. Let me see. And uh, we have a bit of fun as well. I'm afraid. I don't think the dog wrote that note, but I'm not. He may have done. And I only just noticed that the ice cubes by his paws. So I, he obviously was thinking about refrigeration, keeping his paws cool. I, I haven't seen that application before. Cakes, uh, yeah, I don't know why. There's always cakes for refrigeration. Now that one's from Derbyshire Refrigeration in the UK, but there were cakes all over the world. Uh, the, the, the picture below that is people eating ice cream in Singapore. And yes, ice cream is, is obviously a very popular one uh, and that, that's used quite widely. And the language is Korean and bottom right, right on the, the bottom corner, for no, something I've never really understood. There was actually a cricket tournament in Dubai called the World Refrigeration Day Cricket Tournament. And if anybody can ever explain to me why that had any relevance, I'm not quite sure. But it's, 
it just shows the scope and breadth of things that, that are going on. Um, I, I should have said on the previous one, there were, I showed there were leaflets um, that would produce some flyers. A lot of the end users were, were handing these out. The number of supermarket chains were handing them out to customers and schools. So, you know, all this information is being spread around. Uh, what else? What else have we been doing? Training, training, lots of training and skills competitions and community projects. Uh, top left is in uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, yeah, Graham will know that it's that's, that's Maddie Sikande. It's yeah. which one? French. French that yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, yeah, it's Maddie surrounded by uh, what looked like a group of very uh, young women. They're actually trained technicians in refrigeration. And Maddie is very uh, successful at training a whole range of young people into the, and bringing them into the trade. And there we have young women. The uh, top right is, is Skills Fridge in the UK. There was there was a number of heats that took place for World Refrigeration Day. Um, bottom right is uh, in Nigeria. And that was a community thing. They, uh, in some, what I would call, uh, for want of a better phrase, vulnerable housing, I think, or housing for the vulnerable social housing, um, where, where single parent families and, and the like live. They sent in women refrigeration technicians who, who then serviced, repaired the, the air conditioning units for free on the day, uh, both showing the importance of the community and the energy saving because energy and refrigeration and, and maintenance go hand in hand. So it was, it was a very important message. And bottom right, Graham's already mentioned uh, women in RECHP. That was, uh, I think, one of the first training sessions um, where women from our industry who are not necessarily in direct contact we do hands on on the job uh, were given a chance to go to uh, I think that's calls and have a gazing and various other things and I think it was an eye opener for them as well it's a good introduction to the to the industry for them and on the theme of uh, women in the sector uh, Graham has mentioned uh, amazing um, so what is what is that STEMI? Obviously, it's STEM and amazing put together as a word. It's the brainchild of a, a wonderful engineer called Alex Knight, um, very inspirational woman, uh, and engineer to boot. Uh, she 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 seems to have everything going for her. And if Graham had, had to introduce her today, it would have been even more glowing than the one for me. I'm I'm sure. Uh, we were very fortunate to uh, be involved in this this project very early on. Um, very fortunate because it, it has snowballed and has grown. We, we were very lucky. And then the, the pilot scheme ran early in this year, early in 2021. And out of 45 women on the program, we managed to get uh, 30 from the RACHP and the building services sector. So we had a large number of women on the program. The idea is it's a, a four month training program uh, aimed at raising confidence for uh, women role models both on screen and then at the end of the four months uh, or towards the end of the four months they give six um, stem sessions direct to children and that seems pretty daunting to me but th they are by that stage ready to do that and it's it's yes they're giving the stem sessions but they're also bringing themselves as refrigeration people or, or air conditioning or ACH people into the into the schools this is this is just such a step change for us. It's it's amazing, and although it's it's aimed at women, the training course is for women. What we're finding is that they all talk to their colleagues and friends, and so for each woman that we're getting trained to do this, which is a big step forward with role models, we're getting one or two men who who also want to do it. So it, it's a win-win all around. But why is that? Why is it important? I think we all know that women in in the sector is important. But why is it so important? And here's just some statistics from UK state of um, UK government. Uh, Seventy three percent of eleven to fourteen year olds don't know what engineers do. That doesn't surprise me. Sixty nine percent of parents don't know what engineers do. Yeah, I can I can believe all these statistics. Forty two percent of teachers don't feel confident giving engineering careers advice. So yeah there's, there's a lot going on that there's a lot not happening and 49k uh, shortfall in engineers annually that's what's been predicted by the or stated by the, the government and it says at the moment in engineering generally there's 14 percent of women within the sector uh, uh sorry within engineering within the sector the RACH PX sector uh, our estimates are that it's way below 10 percent maybe even between nine and seven percent we are 
even below the, the, the appallingly low average of 14. So there's an awful lot to do. So why is STEM Amazing so successful? What is it? It's aimed at uh, tackling stereotypes based or stereotype base bias, sorry, very early on. Bias starts young. And uh, it's been shown that children between three and five have less stereotypical STEM career choices, or they're less against it. So they, they don't, they're more open to suggestions as to what they may want to do. They haven't formed mm. that you know, engineering is a male dominated thing, uh, profession. It's also found that girls that are interact with male STEM ambassadors or, or educators, that sometimes reinforces the negative stereotype, stereotypical thing that it's, that it's for men only. Whereas when boys interact with women STEM educators, that doesn't occur. So it's a win-win. It's a win-win. We can educate, we can promote it to girls and to boys as well. And if we contact, if we get involved with them early, very early in their, in their childhood, then it's shown that that does improve engagement in STEM. It has a greater impact. So it's win-win. And here's a picture of some of the things that the, the, uh, the women on this amazing cluster. And the pictures, if you remind me very much of, of what was happening with World Refrigeration Day. It's it can be done on screen. Uh, the top left is is a is one of the women doing the uh, training on screen or the STEM session on screen. But it can also be done in person. And you can see it's all very interactive. It's all a lot of fun. And it's exactly what we want to be doing. So it, it was perfect. There was we've just started the second program now, the autumn program, and we are planning a, an international program aimed just at women within the sector across the globe. That will be open to registration in um, mid November, mid this month, and will start in January. Did it make an impact? Uh, yes, they're amazing. We're talking about here. Just in those few months from January, um, it was in June, uh, end of May to June. Over 1,600 children were engaged in the STEM aging. Now that is, I think anybody will say that was me. Were they pleased? Mm -hmm. Yes, they were very pleased. And I won't read this slide. There were two more, but this is what the schools thought. You can, well, I won't read any of it, but they, the children loved it and they can't wait for, for more, basically. And that's exactly what anybody wants to hear and see. So that's that's what we're doing. World Refrigeration Day, and I won't ask Graham what that, that one's actually in Zulu, uh, in case you're wondering. I knew Graham was going to say that straight away, but I'll just, so I can't summarize. It's, it is so obvious when you, when, you, when you say it out loud, Graham, yes. In a warming world, in a decarbonizing world, applications of RACHP are, are set to increase both in quantity and importance. I think Graham's already stated that, and the whole conference here today will, will reinforce that, and what's happening at COP26. The RACHP community is changing its language uh, to raise awareness of our industry, its technology, its applications, and most of all, the people and the career opportunities that, that we have to change the world. Reaching out to our beyond our industry is a challenge. It is a challenge for us, but we, we can do it. And if we do it together, we really can raise what we're doing. And just referring back to that slide from Graham earlier, um, we need to open the eyes of others to the amazing work we do. Um, what more can I say? I think that is, yes, that's the last slide. So that was a, a whistle-stop tour through some, I and mean, there are so many ways we can do this, but that was just some of the examples of what's been going on. Oh, just one statistic yeah. I worked out today, Graham, because this is, this is uh, not off the press, it's just, I was curious by the number 1,600 for the women, uh, sorry, for the school children that have been engaged in STEM Amazing. So I tried to work back mm -hmm. through World Refrigeration Day for three years, how many have been involved young people students or children in in with world refrigeration day mm. i worked out and it was rough because we don't have full nearly half a million worldwide wow over three years that's phenomenal yeah yeah anyway so, no i mean congratulations, to you, congratulations firstly on getting the whole thing off the ground it was a it really was a phenomenal achievement and, and statistics like that really say it all don't they um the Ozone Action Team at, at UNEP have firmly gotten behind you on this project um, now. Um, and I think they, 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 they used that 2019 one, for example, you showed the slide with Refrigerants for Life, which was their annual theme. And um, so the, the Ozone Action Team tend, tend to have an, an annual theme each year, and, and that was what it was that year. So it's really good. Um, in, in particular, I think um, I am an El Taluni and Jim Curran at, at UNEP have been a really they, they, they get what, what we're trying to do with this, don't they? So um, yeah. how, how satisfying has it been 
to see such a huge interest on World Refrigeration Day in places like Africa, for example, where you know where the need to sustainable cooling is so crucial. I mean, you showed this a few slides there with them, um, the likes of um, the work that Maddie Sakandi does in Burkina Faso, for example. And, and anyone who's met Maddie knows he he is a real force of nature, um, and, and he's yes. so influential in Africa. He actually created. Uh, the African U3 uh, ARC, which is uh, an, a, an African association of national associations of RACHP um, engineers. So it's a, he's, a, he's a phenomenal guy, really, and he's been a big influence in it. But you must be um, incredibly satisfied by how it's all taken on such a, a steamroller. Well, I'm, I'm satisfied in, in as much as it's given people the opportunity. It was, it was like letting the industry off the leash. I think previously, uh, and I, I'm talking from my own perspective, I felt that I needed to go through one of the industry bodies to promote something. You know, if, if there was a press release to come out, I had to go through one of the established bodies. You know, I couldn't I couldn't speak to the press direct. It sort of let everybody mm. loose and they, they no longer feel constrained. So all this creativity that you're seeing, I mean, I know cakes and ice cream are not that creative, but, but everything that's going on, it's, let, it's shown just how creative we can be when we're, we're unrestrained um, and united yeah. in what we do. And across Africa, yeah, that that has been. Um, Maddie very kindly uh, launched World Ref uh, his uh, a certain Pan African Association on World Refrigeration. That that was a, a nice mm -hmm. coincidence. Um, but it yeah. it has again given given them a focal point, so they can get the politicians in, they can get the local governments in, and say, look, it's World Refrigeration, mm -hmm. come and speak. And it's happening all over the world. It really is. It's it's an amazing opportunity. It is, yeah. So uh, we we'll have a question from uh, from our old friend Neil Merritt, um, and, it, and it, it kind of ties in quite neatly with with what you've just said there about the global uh, the global aspect to it. He's he's asking um, with COP twenty six currently underway, obviously, how might World Refrigeration Day evolve to consider how cooling can be a vital part of a move to low and zero carbon systems, as opposed to adding to global energy demand. Well, Refrigeration Day is a platform. We, I mean, people like BISA, the, the, there are many technical associations already very active on this. And one of the things that I, I, we try not to do is to duplicate the efforts of others. But what we want to do is, is magnify, amplify their message. So what we can do is take the good work that we are doing, and we are there is some really good work going on in our industry, as, as you well know, Graham, and just give it a platform and say, look, this is what we are doing, because the message is coming back at the moment from you see them in the press all the time, are usually very negative. It's a chance for us to to take some of the good work that's going on and actually say, this is what we're doing. It gives them a voice. It gives us a voice. So yeah. indirectly, I would say that it will refrigeration, but it, you know, we are very much behind supporting all that's going on. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that our whole sector is working really hard to the whole low carbon um, agenda and the net zero agenda as well. So um, I think the more we get the young people engaged at the early stage and we educate them into what we actually do as engineers yeah. will help to get that message across. Yeah. And that's exactly it. We, we all know that and we'll have conferences telling ourselves how good we're doing and working at the agenda. Mm -hmm. But we're very, we're still not good at getting that message outside. I, I, I still yeah. feel that we struggle. We are doing good work and we are we are doing it and we tell ourselves well, and we know we're good. But we, we don't get that message always across. So this is a golden Absolutely. opportunity to do it in, in a number of different ways. Absolutely. No, um, I mean, we sadly are out of time. We're down to the last minute. Um, I did have another question. I was going to ask you about, about how you see the role of projects like STEM Azing drawing school children, school children into the world of engineering in general. But I think the statistics you mentioned already uh, answer that. It, it's a phenomenal achievement and um, it, can only, yeah. it can only help it's a long -term us project. Long. Yeah, it's a long-term project, but, but we can get in there early. We have the resources to do it. We have to know how to do it. What we've not had before is the pool of STEM ambassadors or if for want of a better phrase to do it. Now, now we're uniting and it is a community. If we act as a community, we can really achieve a lot more. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well summed up and perfectly timed, as I can see the, the countdown clock rapidly going down to zero. Um, so just um, finally to say thank you again for joining me, Steve. Um, it's always a pleasure. Um, you're such a huge inspiration uh, on this. And I, I know the women in our CHP group um, think the world of you, uh, as we all do. So um, thanks very much for joining us. 
Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, I hope um, for those who are um, tuned in that you will um, engage with the STEM housing project uh, and help to spread the message. And with that, um, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.